Hi, I'm Chris Lee, and this is Virtually Speaking. Joining me today is Dr. Kevin Elko, a nationally renowned performance consultant and best-selling author who is well-known as the most in-demand and probably the best at what he does in the pro and collegiate sports worlds. In his latest book, Seeing is Believing, the foreword was written by Steve Sabin, probably the best college football coach in history. As a team sports psychologist and performance consultant, Kevin has won a staggering 29 combined Super Bowls and or national championships. He's won the title with the Alabama Crimson Tide five times with Nick Saban and also with the Dallas Cowboys and the Green Bay Packers and the Pittsburgh Steelers and Florida State and LSU and the Miami Hurricanes and many more. He's an important part of a team's success as he evaluates and selects the players. He gives speeches to the teams and he writes the coaches' speeches, and he establishes the mantras for the team to focus on for the year. There might not be anybody better at evaluating mindset or teaching leadership or establishing a culture, and he is in high demand with organizations that deal with high levels of stress and difficult circumstance as he works with people on how they talk to themselves and on how they get the most out of themselves and how to deal with any adversity you may come across. So please join me now with an incredible man who is truly transformative and very healthy for our minds, Dr. Kevin Elko. Well, hello, Dr. Kevin Elko. Thank you for joining me on Virtually Speaking. How the heck are you doing today? Good, Chris. It's great seeing you, old time friend. I miss you so, so good to see you again. Catching up with you has been wonderful. Thank you. You too, man. I always uh, enjoy all the time I get with you. And if you're speaking anywhere near me, I will make sure I am there because you are one of my absolute favorites I've ever seen. I can't wait for the day I'm out there speaking. You know how good it will feel when I'm out there speaking again. So you yeah. think you'd be glad to see me. I'll be more glad to see you, but thanks. <laughs> Absolutely. And you have some more reasons to be uh, coming out to Los Angeles these days. So hopefully, hopefully that'll happen uh, even more than ever. My daughter will be back at UCLA in September, even if they have class or not. So I will be out your way. You've been uh, living in Pennsylvania for, you're, are you from Pennsylvania? No, I, if you can hear, I'm a little bit south from there. I'm from West Virginia. See, that's why you hear that twang. You, you know, just, I, pull out, I pull out my harmonica and start playing for you, man. That's what I usually do once I get going. Because I'm from, <laughs> I'm a little hillbilly. My real name is actually Phil. Not Kevin. So back home, they call me Dr. Phil Billy. <laughs> So I'm That's from great. West Virginia, but I came here to work with the Steelers like in the late 80s and just stayed. And you never left? Never left. Once my kids graduate and I got one to go here, I, I think I might be coming your way. We'll see. Well, you're a busy man on the East Coast. You've been working with the, you worked with the Steelers in the 80s, 90s. You worked with the Eagles pr pretty much ever since. You went to the Super Bowl with uh, uh, a great coach, and I'm sure you're still friends with him, Andy Reid who finally won a Super Bowl. I, I'm sure you knew once he got Mahomes, could you tell that he was going to win a Super Bowl finally? Because he does everything right. I mean, you know, he's a fabulous coach. He's, he's uh, people love him. They love to play for him. There's only a matter of time he's going to win. I mean, real close to him. Matter of fact, when his son passed away, I was one of the first people he called to have me come sit with him when his son, uh, his son overdosed. But yeah, he's just a fabulous person, fabulous coach. Yeah, it was just a matter of time and a way that he can develop quarterbacks and that the synergy he had with Mahomes, I thought they'd be pretty good. Well, yeah, McNabb was no, uh, was, was no shabby quarterback either. We had to, I, I'm a Cowboys fan. As you can see with my uh, Cowboys blue and gray and silver hair, uh, <laughs> you, you know that we uh, had some trouble with McNabb for many years. But you were also with my Cowboys back in the Cowboys day. With wow, I love being down there. Dion was there and Michael Irvin and Troy Aikman and it was it was a good time. I love being there. You yeah. know, Woodson and it was it was a special group. I was on and the they, phone with I was on the phone with Emmett Smith uh, the other day and um, we were talking about you. I know you have a quote from him that that, that uh, you've been allowed to use. I love that quote. That's the thing about you that's so cool, is that you have not only succeeded at the highest level but with the highest level succeeders and winners and great ones of our day in a lot of sports you're able to work with them and they all are able to get something from you which is which is unbelievable I mean Andy Reid and Nick Saban one of the greatest coaches of all time Andy Reid and 
uh, Bill Cower and Jimmy Johnson. And you were with Jimmy uh, in Miami uh, before he came to Dallas. Is that right? No, no, I was in Miami with Butch. I was oh, okay. There's, and um, we won. I mean, there's the U. See that bad boy right there? Oh, Miami. So we won. But I was there with Butch Davis and I was there with Larry Coker when we won it. Okay, yeah, Larry so, Coker. Yeah. Another great coach. So when Jimmy came to Dallas, how did Jimmy Johnson find out about you? Because you were there with him from the beginning. Actually, it wasn't Jimmy that found out. It was uh, Jerry Jones did. What happens is Steelers played the Cowboys. And we played in a game. And um, in the game, our quarterback, Neil O'Donnell, threw two interceptions. They picked off. And they won. Two oh, years. Neil O'Donnell. Yeah, I love him. Yeah, sure you do. <laughs> and so afterwards, uh, Jerry called the Steelers and go, I had – this before salary cap, any of that was going on, Chris. He goes, I've got a lot more money in this team than you've got in your team. And they go, what's the difference? And they go, well, Kevin Elk on the selection process. And so we had a selection process, a selection test. And what we really looked at, and we're starting to do some off-fields now, is the great ones have a way they see themselves. So we looked at the whole concept of self-concept, how they see themselves. Even now, the resiliency, I have signs on my wall. You know, um, one is, I was, you know, I was born for the storm. The calm doesn't suit me. So we really got into self-concept with the Steelers and the way that they viewed themselves. And then Jerry got very, very fascinated by it all. And he was the one that reached out. So I then went from uh, Pittsburgh to down there to help them. And it was an interesting time, interesting group of people, how they did things. But it really came off of my self-concept work with the Steelers insofar as Pittsburgh had the smallest budget during that time. That's mm. the second best record behind the 49ers. Wow. And it was, it's how do people have a concept of how they view themselves, what we got into. That's amazing. And of course, the, the concept of how the Cowboys viewed themselves changed almost overnight with Jerry Jones purchasing them, unfortunately firing, you know, the, the legendary coach uh, who was there forever, Tom Landry and, Broke everybody's heart. But Jimmy Johnson was an absolute winner. They had a friendship and a kinship for many years before that and brought you in. And then in 89, and then within just three or four years, we're in the playoffs and won the Super Bowl in 93. So that's pretty amazing. You know, when you go in with the teams, I, you know, watching the different things that people do, um, I think that when they come in, they teach culture. That's the big thing, Chris. I mean, even Cal Entertainment has a culture. And a culture means there's a set way that we think and we do things. The great ones have a set way they think and they do things. That's the big thing with Nick Saban in Alabama. There's always a culture. Here's what you teach. And it means the way that we think. And the big thing that I try to emphasize in my books and my talks and everything is, listen closely, winning teams have their own language. The only way they speak. And you go and you try to develop that language. Like in Alabama, so what, now what? Care of the water until it becomes wine. You know, in Alabama, you've got this, the, the, the phrase, get comfortable being uncomfortable. That's what manufactures about five of them bad boys. You know how women say that diamonds are a girl's best friend? I like them too. <laughs> so what you get into is it's a language. In my new book I have out, Believing a Sing, Saban wrote the first chapter. It's the language of winning. So, and so, so wait. Time you get in there, that's what they're going after, Chris. What, what did you just say a moment ago? Uh, was one of the monikers uh, down there in Alabama. So what, now what? So what, now what? Amazing, yeah. amazing. What's where, a great line is, look, there's a lot of research today about the relationship between resiliency. Resiliency is your ability to come back. When they're looking at the facts, one time they're talking about grit, but you, know, you and I are really good friends with John Dornboss. John talked about you know, his uh, coming up, father killing his mother, then thought his career was going, had an aneurysm, heart about to explode, had to recreate his career. Resiliency is my ability to come back. And there's a proverb, when I fall, who I become will catch me. It's an old Jewish proverb. I can come back stronger. But what you want to do is look at the factors. When you look at all the research out, the skill of resiliency, coming back, especially in this thing with COVID and all the things we have going on right now, is the factor. And so it's a couple of things, my identity, um, how I see me, and the second one is this language. So a phrase that I've been using this everywhere, I, I should get you to trademark it for me, is so what, now what? 
And once you start speaking, listen to this phrase, neurons that fire together, wire together. What does that mean? Neurons that fire together, wire together. Your brain's made up of a zillion different neurons that carry messages, okay? So I'm on a cruise with my sister and her two kids, my, my son, last year. Her son goes for 5,000 times a day on the cruise. For sure, for sure, for sure, for sure. Want to play basketball? For sure. Want to get some ice cream? For sure. I'm about ready to lose my mind. For two weeks after that cruise, I'm walking around going, for sure, for sure, <laughs> for sure. So what we do is we want to blame things on the past. We want to blame things. But really, who we are today is a result of the way we decide to think and speak yesterday because our brains grew very easily. And the problem we have is our brains are not wired for happy. Our brains aren't even wired for success. Your brain is wired for survival. Fear. So it's looking, it's looking all the time for something to look to survive. We're looking for danger, so we're Velcro for bad. If we don't on purpose pick up things, language, vision, our brains will stay programmed for the bad. So listen to this phrase, so what, now what? The first part of it. We need to get our minds quiet, no mental clutter. If I can't do something about it, so what? There's a lot of things I don't like about getting older. I don't like that you can sneeze and pull muscle. <laughs> I like what Billy Chris said, the comedian. I don't like it to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, it's in Morse code. <laughs> you know what I love about getting older, Chris? What? Stupid stuff doesn't matter anymore. They carried me out of this house in an ambulance three years ago, June 5th. Took me to Cleveland Clinic to my Miss Dime by two minutes. After that happens to you, stuff doesn't matter anymore. Stuff used to make you lose your mind. So what? And no. as you get older and you go through more, success to me is not adding on, it's getting rid of and learning what not to pay attention to. So, so what? The next phrase, now what? COVID came. I'm Chris Lee. My speakers were canceled. Now what? Well, I better get out there and get some virtual bookings. Now what? I better go this out, or I better try some other things. Now what? So, so what, now what is a phrase that we use often. It's my first chapter, Saban wrote. He wrote the chapter called So What, Now What? So there's a little town, I love this story, called Enterprise, Alabama. They're growing <laughs> cotton. Bull weevil wipes them out. So there's a brand new crop called the peanut. They plan to become wealthy from the peanut. Now in the middle of Enterprise, a big statue of, of a bull weevil. And it goes, thank you, Mr. Bowie, for the role you play in our prosperity. Wow. When you speak that phrase and you develop language, look, I hope you get every speaker out there you can get. But the fact of the matter is until you start speaking a language and the whole place speaks it, you don't have culture. You don't have it. So we went in the Eagles and they won it. When you go to Alabama and they won it, Florida State and they won it, Miami won it, it's the language. And you go in and you develop it, you speak it, change the whole place. That's Amazing. the key. That's the key. Amazing. And, 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 you're, and you're really good at getting that message defined. It's not like you bring the same message wherever you go, right? I mean, you have a way of finding out what kind of people you're working with, dealing with, and then you get to say and, and kind of remind them of the things that matter to them in their circumstance, right? I mean, I know when planes have crashed, you've been there to uh, console the family's victims. The, the, I think it was the one of the legislator kind of people in government uh, called you in because they know you knew you were the right guy when Andy Reid lost his you know son you were one of the first people he called when uh, a, a women's basketball team in the south had a coach who um, or a player who was it a player who died or a coach who died I mean right. you're, you're, you're the guy who knows what to say so how do you know how do you know what to say is it is it just the same mindset and you kind of just on the spot pick it out or do you have to take time to figure out what it is you're going to be thinking of and what you're going to be saying, or is it just instinctual to you? Well, let me answer two ways. Learned behavior becomes instinct. When you've done something over and over and over, in some ways you get instincts from living and you get instincts from paying attention. But even when you've called me hurting, it's connection, Chris. We don't know how to connect anymore. And I'm working now with a pharmaceutical company and we're doing virtual live training. And the last one was, I just did Friday, on the ability to connect. Here's what connection is. I see you as a person. It's it listed it self-talk phrase. Be where your feet are. It's learn to be with somebody and sit and understand. 
where are you? And you have to understand something about grieving. Did you know love has a price? I know you just lost your mom. You know love has a price? You know what the price is of love? Grief, it's a broken heart. And you, a, a friend of mine just lost her son to COVID, young man in New York City. And you just sit with them. And the thing you wanna do when somebody's hurting is we think we wanna heal them. No, something bigger than you heals them. You wanna sit with them. You wanna be a friend to them. You wanna be able to connect. And what you do is you give them permission to start grieving. But there's something powerful in healing, championships, companies, United States of America, and connection. I see you as a somebody. And when you go in, the plane crash you're talking about, I'm going up an escalator, and it's US Air, plane goes down, and a US Air official, there's me, psychologist, two priests. US Air official goes, no survivors. But there's like 50 people up there waiting for their loved one to come off of that plane. They're not coming. You work with the people who make the announcement. So there's a guy at the bar. He keeps on screaming at one of the priests. Hey, father, did my wife make it? The priest just kept looking at his shoes. He knew. Finally, the U.S. Air official came in making an announcement. No survivors. Guy came up the bar and said to everybody, I'm tearing him apart. I'm going to tear him apart. So I'm holding him back. It's breaking out in this whole room. I'm screaming to the priest, get the U.S. Air official out of the room. No pressure, I'm armed. I look back, I thought he'd be driving me to get to the official. There's a woman now over here a different direction and she's screaming and crying because she just realized her husband didn't make it. He went down over to her, he fell down, he held her. Do you understand what happened? It was, I had a dangling Chris in thin air. He knew what he needed, he gave it. And I've never seen him again, I bet he's okay. To your answer, it's all connection. You go in, and what we are finding today is there's a big relationship between connection in cells, in, you know, our motto with the Eagles, an individual can make a difference, you know, an individual can make a difference, a team can make a miracle. There's your bling bling on that one right there. I know you're <laughs> either, and you can absorb that. But when you come together, we get to teach people to be connectors. Miracles happen. And so you're really trying to go in first and just connect. Where are they? Where are they feeling? Let me be a great listener and understand what's going on. That, that's what you do when you go in. So uh, there's got to be something. First of all, you keep on holding up these championship and, uh, you know, Super Bowl rings. down. How many, how many Super Bowl and championship rings do you have down there? I got them all sitting right here. I've got 29. <laughs> oh, my God. That's a lot. I know yeah, you were also there with Aaron Rodgers and uh, Mike McCarthy. Yeah, so now – Let's, so I'm a Cowboys fan, so Mike McCarthy is the new head coach of the Dallas Cowboys. Was that a great hire for, for the Cowboys to make the best one they could I think, make? I think he's fabulous, Coach. I knew him from years ago. He's from where I live now, and I knew him from we were to New Orleans Saints. I think he's a fabulous teacher. I love one of the things he did. He had a standing day with Aaron Rodgers every uh, Friday connection. I loved how he went into the um, Super Bowl in just a relaxed state. You know, the night before the Super Bowl, one of the, uh, one of the um, Packers got on the uh, piano and was playing Get on the Jesus Train. I'm getting ready to speak to the team. I hit, and I, you know, people are dancing around. Aaron Rodgers dancing around. Looks like Steve Martin, the jerk. I'm watching everybody <laughs> dance around. I hit Mike McCartney. I punched him. You just won the Super Bowl. I go, look how loose. You just won the Super Bowl the night yeah. before. Yeah, I said, you just, and one of the things he did, we decided to do is we measure everybody for their rings before. Ooh. So, yeah, and the energy was just so good. And the, the title of the talk was, let's do something while outlive us. And it was a lot of fun to do. And it was a lot of energy in the room. But he, I think it was a fabulous hire. I love Mike. I have respect for the Cowboys organization. Of course. I, I think he'll win down there pretty good. And I love the way he develops relationships with, uh, with different people, including he'll, he's a great teacher. And so with who they've got now, Dak, I think that relationship will really flourish. Well, yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens with that. Otherwise, uh, if Aaron gets in any more unhappy in Green Bay, you know, Jerry will be coming. I don't know anything about all that, but I think Aaron <laughs> Rodgers is pretty special. I mean, if I had a chance yeah. to take, I'll take. He's, I he's, think he's special. 
he well, one of the greatest one way of the he greatest reads, the way he gets the ball out of his hands, the way he, you know, the kind of a person he is, he's pretty special. And he's an amazing, amazing quarterback uh, and leader, obviously. So, okay, so now we, we was kind of talked about a lot of these people that you've come to know, these incredible coaches who depend on you. I know Nick Saban famously said, I will not let anybody else talk to my team except for Dr. Kevin Elko. Um, I saw that great Belichick and Saban uh, documentary on HBO. It's wonderful where the two greatest coaches alive are our best friends. It's amazing. And they get together every year and they connect as you're talking about as, as friends and they learn from each other. Belichick steals some plays and ideas from Saban and Saban of course steals some things from Belichick and they love it. They're friends. And I guess the worst thing that happened in their careers was they used to have to play each other twice a year, but only for two years when Saban was down there in Miami. Were you with Saban in Miami? Uh, he asked me to go. I didn't go. So you, I, I, at the time I just, and I, I was with him at LSU the whole time or, or when he won, you know, toward the end. Um, but I, I, it just wasn't a good fit. I knew it wasn't a good fit. He, he oh, did a good him. job. Yeah. But I, no, but I've been with him the whole time, Alabama. Well, so let's talk about these people, these coaches, these players. I mean, you at this point, 29 championships in the colleges and pro football. And I guess there's a couple other sports thrown in there too. There um, uh, you must know at this point. You, I, I mean, I would think I have a pretty good sense of intuition about speakers and about plus customers and clients. But you must have a real good idea for who you're in the room with, who you're standing with. And that's what you were talking about. The selection process is what the differentiating factor of the Steelers was when Jerry Jones said, well, what makes you guys so great? And it was the, it was the selection process of the players. I know that incredible story that you told, uh, and I don't know if you still tell it, but you should. It's, it's one of the best ones I remember is the Torrey Holt story where you said to him when you were drafting him for the Steelers, you know, how is it you were able to play – with a, uh, a, a broken, a, a dislocated shoulder for part of last year. And he said, no coach, it was the whole year I had a dislocated shoulder. And I figured if I was, uh, my mom was able to go to work with cancer, that I'm able to get on the field with a dislocated shoulder the whole season. And, and you told Bill Cowher at that moment, we got to take this guy. He's got that championship mindset, even though he's smaller and not as fast and his hands are smaller and all the things that you want in a receiver, he doesn't necessarily have. They trade him to the Rams. He goes on to be one of the greatest receivers in the history of football. So that was a long time ago. By now, you must be a master of standing in a room and knowing who you're in that room with. And what I mean by that is you know when somebody's great, right? I mean, what is it? Can you tell? What do they have in common? Tell us a little bit about what greatness looked like. Ownership. I mean, it comes down one to ownership. And the best predictor, Chris, of the future is the past. It, it comes down to ownership. And this, this one sentence, we talk uh, about language, this one sentence, the best year of your life, the year you take ownership of everything comes your way. It's ownership. That does not, I own things like losing my mother. I, I don't own that, but I own my response to it. And when you get inside athletics, what you'll do is inside, and I'm doing this even today with companies, you get in, the group takes accountability with each other. And you're having a relationship like, not like you're the warden, but it's a partnership. And you're making people take ownership of the process. And when you get inside, if you want to ask me what's behind all these rings that are sitting over here, that inside the ownership went to the team. I don't work with Steve Kerr, but I love this story. Steve Kerr and the Warriors were playing the Phoenix Suns. And he was frustrated with the team, so he said to one of the players, I think it was Green, he said, here, you go coach the team. So he handed him the clipboard, you know the story. He handed him the clipboard and Kerr sat at the end of the bench and the players coached the game. And they won by 62 points. When you can put ownership and the closer ownership moves to people, the more winning you're going to have. And that line right there basically saved my life. The best year of your life, you take ownership of every problem in your life. It comes down to ownership. So when you watch somebody like Tori Holt, and I tell you that story, if my mom go to work with cancer, I could play football. What he was saying to himself was because of this happened, he learned a way to talk to himself. He took ownership of his life. He didn't play the blame game. He didn't pout. He didn't get into what's called self-pity. He just said, here's what I have. And we get in the way of ourselves. Got what really turned us around Alabama was a tornado. 
tornado came through town in Tuscaloosa and, and killed over 50 people. Our long snapper name was Carson Tinker. He's holding his fiance in a closet, threw him 200 feet, killed her, <gasps> broke his body up. And so what now what? He led us. He led us building um, homes. If we, we let, he led us building homes for other people. When you look at anybody talk about, you know, the Kobe Bryants that didn't just saw with Jordan with the last dance, they take ownership, the champs do, of everybody around them. There's a difference between a pro ball player and a super ball player. Pro ball player, I'm looking at my own performance. The super ball players say, no, I need everybody to be lifted. And so Jordan and Ray Lewis, Ray Lewis was my was there, used to say, match my intensity, match me. So what's the difference with the great ones? If, if Chris and Kevin are together, then I come, you go, Chris, I just watched you. You're a father of, the, of these two beautiful uh, twins, this amazing woman. I, this, that's just hypothetical, of course. You're, I just watched what you did. You're a better man than that. That's what the champs do. Hey, you know. And they can I take watch, it. But it's also you can take that criticism take it. Without, right. without getting defensive and being insecure and, and being able to listen to that other person you respect say something to you that might hurt that might they and they might be willing to say it to you because they know you can take it you have to coach the teams on the front end on two things one separating the who from the do chris uh you can do better than that blue blazer you need a green blazer no, i'm <laughs> kidding I'm, te I'm teasing i'm teasing right so you could say one of two things who i am is wrong or what i did is wrong or i don't accept that i could do one of those two things and look, we have a big, big epidemic going on today. You want, want to tell you what it is? Offended. Yep. It's a big epidemic. I'm, it, it's everywhere. People have been offended the last few years, 10 years. You can't look at somebody without them getting offended. So when you go in and Kevin Elko works with the team, we start off talking about being coached and learning how not to be offended. You know how much energy that sucks from us? Here I am, Christy, I'm trying to build Cal Entertainment. I'm trying to put blessings out there. I'm trying to feed my family. If I walk around offended, you know how much energy is sucked from you that you can't go do that, that you can't go do your vision. And we get mental clutter. So what you want to teach them is how to be coached, how to grow, how to have a deliberate practice. But here is the big problem we've got. Most people pay attention to feelings. Yeah. I feel like quitting. I feel frustrated. I feel self-pity. I feel offended. I feel bored and angry that I'm being kept at home right now and I can't leave my house, even though it's so dangerous for me to do so and go hang out with a hundred other people in a crowded space. I feel like I want to do that. I feel like I can't hang out at home. One more minute. And so greatness happens, Chris, to your question, when we pay attention to choices not feelings. So I am a big fan because I speak constantly. So I study speakers. When I used to play ball, I studied ball players. Now I study speakers. If you're going to study speakers, you have to study Martin Luther King. So I got into his style. Then I got into his content. So I went down to the Lorraine Hotel where Martin Luther King was shot. I went to see all of everything that happened in Memphis, Tennessee. I read about it. Martin Luther King was leading a protest in Memphis, Tennessee, of the sanitation workers. He didn't like the way they acted, so he was doing it a second time. What he did the second time is when he got shot, and that protest did not happen. The protest did happen the next day. You know who led it? Coretta Scott King, his wife. She could not have felt like it. Wow. But she chose to. Greatness, you're listening to people talk. And when you're interviewing, you're saying, tell me of a time. So you're looking for greatness and you say, tell me the time. You're listening for a couple phrases. Here's one. I decided. So I've got Carson Wentz, Philadelphia Eagles, paying me to find him a quarterback. Tell me the best game you ever had in your life. Kept on saying one word. He made, he just made over $100 million recently because he kept saying this word. We. I was, he thought I wanted to hear about that game. I didn't care about the game. I want to hear if he's going to say I or we. We came together. We focused. 
We ran out there. We, you know, we prayed. He kept us saying the word we. I stepped out and saw Jeffrey Lurie in the hallway. I said, I interviewed six quarterbacks. That one kept on saying we. Go with that one. So you're listening for language. And, and there was an article in the Wall Street Journal that says successful people speak different than unsuccessful people. They say the word we, not I. They say the word I decided, not I felt. And the third thing, they talk about what they do want. They don't talk about what they don't want. <laughs> so you can really make an assessment to your question. Just make them talk and listen. We, are you going to talk about what you do want? And are you going to talk about I decided? And what you're looking at, you don't want their philosophies. I want events. Tell me the time. Tell me about the past. You're, you're asking them questions, okay? And as you're asking them questions, you're listening for we. I decided, and you want to hear them talk about what they do want. And the big thing is, past is the best predictor of the future. I want to hear you talk about your past. I don't want your philosophies. I want concrete things from your, from your past. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're dating somebody, love's new, and you're with them, and this person says, my ex said this about me, my ex said that about me, and love's new, so you go, your ex is such a jerk. You're with him about three months, you know what you're thinking? Your ex has some good insight. <laughs> so you're really trying to get, when you go in, so let's do this proactively. You're going in, you're speak. you're talking about language. No sports teams had the success. New Zealand All Blacks. Nobody. They study aborigines in Australia on walkabouts. They sang their destination to existence. Their parents taught them songs of faith. So speaking the words and then thinking words, and then the coach reinforcing the words in a company, individuals, think the words, speak the words, leadership, reinforcing the words. That's how you win. That's greatness. And you talked about the language. Yeah. And you talked about, um, that's amazing. That, that's, that's really good stuff, Kevin. And, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing to, to, to hear and know that just words that you think or words that you say can make such a difference to your own mindset. It's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, in, in this book, Believing is Sing, in our book here, we did a study, came out of the Cleveland Clinic. The average person has 70 to 90,000 thoughts a day. I don't know how they figure that out. 80% of those thoughts are negative. And let me tell you why. We aren't designed as I said earlier, for happy, for success. We're designed to survive. So your mind's always looking for something bad that can happen. That's why if you make a mistake, you keep thinking about the mistake. That's why if somebody hurts you, you can think about what they did because you're trying to, your mind's trying to say, I don't want that repeated. Mm -hmm. So it's like when you bring the computer home from the store, when the baby comes home, that's how we're wired. You have to rewire to be a success. You have to rewire to be happy. You have to rewire to go to the next level. And so what you're doing is you're kind of come in. And if you're bringing in, if you're Chris Lee and you're bringing a speaker, I get it. It's warm, fuzzy. It's chicken soup for soul. I'm talking steak and potatoes here. You want to come in and go, look, I need more than that. Let me just not get you inspired. Let me get you rewired. And you want to do it by coming in and bringing giving the company. Get in touch with this language. Speak it, teach it, and come again and let that be your culture. That's what you're going after. And that's what leads to all these championships. Mm -hmm. And you were talking about Kobe Bryant and um, Michael Jordan earlier, who were tough leaders, who maybe had some teammates that didn't like them because they were pushed so hard. There's different styles of leading. There's the tough leader like Kobe and Michael, but they, they may be two of the very best of all time. But, uh, the people who are the opposite of that, is that just a choice that you make uh, kind of, you know, instinctually because that's just who you are, but it can work in two different ways, being a tough guy or more of a nice guy, or is it, what do you prefer? Or what do you think? How do you think that works out? That turns out. Yeah, I think one of the deals is of course, you know, I, I work with Saban, you know, and I say, here's two good day with Nick Saban. I'll go coach. What do you want me to say to team? And I'll get, how in the blank do I know? If I knew what the blank to say, I would have said it. <laughs> okay. So people love him. I love him. When you get to know him, that's not quite him. But he's him. I've watched his people there, his assistants, 
not all of them, some of them not going to have success because they tried to be a version of Saban. Kobe was being Kobe. And Michael Jordan had all these games competing growing up where, you know, that's how they were wired. If you watch their lives, what they've done, they, they're interesting to me. Like Jordan, there was a player, I, was just, I just had an offer from the other day. There was a player who had 36 points against him, BJ, I forget his last name, I can't remember the name. So he had 36 points against him. And so he said, Michael said, he said to me after the game, because Michael's guarding him, nice game, Michael. Uh-oh. The next day, so he told his team, I went and scored 36. I'm going to score that many in the first half. He did. Years later, he said, he never said that I made it up. So a lot of the guys on that level, they almost need to create a Judas, if you will. They need to create somebody they're going to rise above. And that's fine. They said every day Larry Bird would get in a paper and see what Magic Johnson did. And I've got to do better. That's something within us, evolutionary, that some people do. My point to your question is, be who you are. Could I, could I come and I have people in my life. I was with them last night and we did a long talk about things we idolize. And we sat around and talked about the things we idolize that bring no fruit. And I have the kind of friends that we challenge each other. And one of them is right now downstairs. I've hired this person to help me with my books and she's helping me. But I'm friends with her and her husband. We're best friends. You don't have, if your personality is Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant, and you want to have an accountability relationship with others, okay, do we be who you are. But if you're Chris Lee and you're Kevin Elko, and you're Chris Lee and you have a more gentle spirit, I mean, you don't have to have the kind of spirit, you don't have to manufacture a spirit that you're not. Right. You know, I sit down with my kids. I sit down with my kids' friends, and I, okay, my son has a friend who had leukemia, recovered, and he's drinking now. He's underage drinking and driving. He was at my home two nights ago. My daughter came to me and was literally crying about him. I sat down and go, I said to this boy, I'll leave his name out. I go, when, when he got diagnosed with leukemia, I was the first one he called. He goes, I need somebody here who can believe in miracles. Get Mr. Elko in here. So I sat down with him. I go, when you were in a hospital for five months, I visit you all the time. I said, Clint Hurdle, manager of Pirates, different Steelers, I visit you. I love you. I'm worried at the decisions you're making. I'm worried that you're drinking and driving. I'm worried that the lifestyle you're doing might even give rise to a relapse of leukemia. I didn't do that Kobe Bryant style. It was a different situation. And I'm sure Kobe didn't talk to his children, young people that way. Yeah. You know, so I think you have to know where you are. So as a leader, as we all watch, let's say you're leading and you're running Pfizer Pharmaceutical. You don't have, and you watch that on Last Dance. Do you have to go in as a leader as Pfizer and do it like Michael? No, do it like you but make people accountable. There's a way of doing it that matches you. Right. And so to that boy, that, I guess that was my version of Michael, uh, uh, you know, Michael, Michael Jordan. So let's get to your favorite coach, Tom Landry. He said all the time, I need to make people do the things they don't want to do so they can have the things they want to have. <laughs> and That's he was the, not, he was not a very friendly coach either. No, he was probably, he was somewhat cold, you know, but I think people knew his spirit, knew his ethics, and knew what he was doing. I loved him. Yeah, I loved him, too. I loved his fan. innovation and what he did. I loved his innovation in yeah. coaching, but it was tough. But so aren't some people born leaders and born great? I mean, I've heard some speakers who I like talk about you can teach leadership. I, I Personally, I kind of disagree with that. I mean, I think that you, everybody has leader in them. Everybody can be a leader. But I feel like some people want to win and want to succeed more than others. And I think some people are better at getting a group to focus on something or visualize something or, or hear something than others. 
don't you think that part of this is also you were born with it? That's a great question. I mean, I don't know the answer to that. I were they born to it? I watch my daughter now, who's watched me. She leans an she leans seems an awful lot like me. Was did she was she born with it or did she watch me? I even watched some of my words come out of her. Mm -hmm. So I don't that, you know that's a big question. If you look at a lot of the research on what they call fixed or a, a you know a, a fixed mindset or a growth mindset. Mm. You look at a lot of the works that's out there by Carol Dweck. The answer is it's something we develop. That's their, that's what they're saying. Um, a lot of people are saying things with research that when you have a fixed mindset, this is who you are, this is what you have. And even kids that believe that IQ is a growth thing, they do what they do better in school. People who believe that that growth is a a growth mindset is the reality. They achieve more life. I guess I would say to your question, I don't know the answer, but I would pretend like the answer is you can always learn. Because if that's the way you look, if you go, well, you're just born with it. So I play guitar. When I'm playing the guitar, I can say, oh, this is, this is all the better you can get. Then I'm gonna hit a wall. Oh, you were just born a musician. You were in a wall. But if you look, look at a lot of lives like Whitney Houston, her mother was a gospel singer, so she watched her sing. So was she born with it or was it something that was mirrored? But if you look at the research of somebody like Carol Dweck, when I hit, if I had frustration and I have a set mindset, I'd go, oh, this is all the better I can get. If I had frustration with a growth mindset, I'd go, I'm frustrated, my mind's growing. So my answer would be always say to yourself, I believe in a growth mindset. Because whether it's true or not, you're going to do much better. And just say, right. oh, I am what I am. Right, right. It's the, same, it's the same people who go to happy hour every day that you talk about. Yeah. They complain about how often everything is. They call it happy hour. You know, it, they, 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 as opposed to taking ownership to it. So I think you have to say, what are the skills I can do? And really, here's, all, here's all leadership is, Chris. It's real simple. My ability simplify it. Simplify it. I like ability it. Ability to influence how somebody thinks and acts. That's leadership. If I can influence how somebody thinks and acts, but if I'm influencing you for the benefit of me, that's manipulation. If I'm influencing you for the benefit of the whole organization, that's leadership. That's different. So it doesn't have to be Kobe esque. It doesn't have to be Michael Jordan esque. Let me just show you your. I can sit down with you. Go. I'll get here. Chris, you have an unbelievable ability to stay resilient and persistent. That's a gift you have. I've seen in very few people. That's a fact. That was leadership right there. I just showed you, here's your gift. I'm giving you permission. Now you go, give yourself permission. Be bold and do that. that so if I'm going around a company, a guy worked for Johnson Johnson for years, and incidentally, I just went to work with the Jets uh, last year. Before you say anything, they won their last six, six and two toward the end. We got them going to the end. But their owner is the Johnsons. A guy used to go around with Johnson Johnson with a stick going DWD, damn well done. So he did all day long. Great leadership. Great leadership. Just pointing out somebody's gift and watching them do a process. And what was that great story about turning things around? And it obviously came from leadership. I'm, cur I'm curious about where it actually came from. But um, I think it was Alabama had played somebody earlier in the year. Uh, and and they they uh, maybe they had won, and the second time they were playing them, they were down by a whole bunch. Or no, I'm combining two stories together. I remember now. There was a, a, a game where you guys had gotten destroyed by this team, and now you're playing them a second time in the playoffs. But before the game, you had everybody take a ball out and dedicate it to somebody who changed oh. their life. No. I, you're, what happened is we're at LSU. Oh. And they beat, uh, was it Georgia? Yeah, it was yeah, Georgia. Yeah, it was Georgia. They beat them by four the first time. And oh. they had a loss. Their loss came from Florida. And they were playing for the SEC championship. And uh, if they win this game, they're going to play Oklahoma for the national championship. And so they brought out a ball and put the number 68 on it. Yarmer Yager was a hockey player for the Czech Republic. He wore the number 68 when he played because 1968 was the year of the Russian occupation of Czechoslovakia. 
I work with the Penguins, work with Yager, and save and love the story. So everybody got a football, and they said dedicate it to anybody in this game. And you know, one said I dedicate to my to my son, us and my grandmother. And they send the ball before the game started. And so they played them a second time and beat them by four touchdowns. And because they had like intrinsic motivation, it was this is our 68. And then we went on to play Oklahoma, and it, and it resulted in with that little LSU. <laughs> LSU. So is, what's the psychology behind that? Is that something we could do across all areas of our life is, is kind of dedicate something to or envision? You did that with, with the Green Bay uh, Super Bowl as well. It's kind of like visualizing this is we're going to win before we win or we're dedicating it to somebody. What's the mindset there? People are addicted. I mean, there's a lot of, of people believe that there's a lot of big of addiction to external motivation. And, you know, let's get fired up. Let's watch the video. Let's get the rah-rah. But it really comes down to what they call intrinsic motivation. What inside of you makes you want to do it? So back to the boy um, that I was talking about who had leukemia. So I sat down and talked with him. And he's a 4.0 student. I go, what do you want to do with your life? He goes, I'm going to be a pediatric oncologist. So that's what you call, it's not, that's what's inside of me. That's my internal motivation. I was not a very good high school student. It made me, I think, a pretty good teacher, which I was for a while. That was my intrinsic motivation. When I told you the story about the man inside the room, he went over to hold that, that other woman. His hurt was his intrinsic motivation. So 68, what is it inside of you? And so what you're looking at, as opposed to pulling out this outside, Rah, rah. So a lot of time what Saban will talk about, and we'll talk about Alabama, is a lot of players will talk about, I want their respect. Well, what about your own self-respect? Yeah. What about respecting yourself? How about looking at the mirror at the end of the day and thinking about what you did? And what you'll find a lot of times when you go out and do things to help people, you, you, you'll go out to do things for external um rewards and they're not going to be there Chris or you're going to be really upset when you see the reward coming in but self-respect a job well done something inside of me that is coming out is really what you're going after so what you're really doing with teams is we're playing for each other it's that minute you come off and you've got to look across the field at your friends in the room with one another and go we did a great job we came together we helped one another or I didn't at all and so intrinsic motivation is what you're doing with that 60 history. What inside of me? And if you look at like World Cup soccer, there's an inverse relation between the size of the country and how successful the team does. So really the teams that do the best are the smaller countries because they're thinking we're playing for people back home. Right. That's the intrinsic motivation. Got it. I'm playing for something inside of me. And that's what the 68 story was about with uh, LSU and Saban and winning the national championship. Got it. And you are somebody who I tell people about all the time. And I tell them, you know, what he does is he gets you to not let the circumstance that you're in affect who you are or how you feel. And right now, as a nation, as a world, for the first time ever, we are in some pretty serious circumstance. So what is the mindset that everyone, the business owner, the housewife, the stay-at-home dad, the student, the nine to five worker of, of a job that's uh, you know an essential job, or the person who's out of work, who can't find a job right now. What is the mindset that everybody right now needs to really take on as we, as we feel this circumstance all around us. Chris, you're doing a great job on this interview and this is a great question. I'm gonna introduce a concept here. It's called inattentional blindness. You've got something sits back here in your brain and it's called your reticular activation system. It sits right here. And from it comes a phrase, inattentional blindness that you'll hear psychiatrists, psychologists, behavioral people talk about. You see 25,000 things today on a day where we're not locked down. You see 25,000 things. You remember about 10, 10 to 12 at the end of the day. 
I tell people, think about the car you drive. The day after you bought that car, did you see it everywhere? You see it everywhere. You know, you see that car everywhere. I tell people I bought a BMW. I didn't know there was 500 of them on my block. I differ mine a little bit though. I put a CB radio in it. So what happens is this right here changed when you bought the car because you, this changed your reticular activation system here and your eyes changed. So here comes a phrase, casualness causes casualties. If you just casually let floats in your brain. And so what controls this is what you feed you and what you speak. So I was going through the Tampa airport going, I'm not looking for blessings to come into my life. I want to be a blessing. That's my phrase. I want to be a blessing. I see a woman standing at Southwest Council. She's screaming. I said, what's wrong? She said, my daughter was blown up in a Humvee in Afghanistan. They life lighted her to call me in the Anna St. Vincent Hospital, burn unit. I go, where's your suitcase? I don't have one. Do you have anything? She said, I have a driver's license. I said, that's all you have? Yeah. I said, you have me. And we got her from Tampa to Carmen Anna to her daughter. I called her and said, Rabita, how's your daughter? She says, she squeezed my hand, but um, I think she's gonna make it, but I sat with her girlfriend and she passed away right before her parents came in. Why did I see her? That woman's at the airport a lot of times, but that day I saw her because I was speaking it and I was feeding it to me. I want to be the blessing. I want to be the blessing. I fed it and I saw it. So let's just say you're going about today in this environment and you're not deliberately feeding you. I want to be a blessing. There's opportunity. Live in vision. Don't live in circumstance. You're not feeding you that. You're just casually letting fed to you what's in the social media, the television, the papers, the world. Well, if that's what you're feeding you, guess what you're seeing? No opportunity, no blessings, gloom. We're going to hell in a handbasket. This will never be over. Don't know when. That's what's coming now. But if you don't take command of it, you're never going to see the job. You're never going to see opportunity. You're never going to see a speaking engagement. You're going to see opportunity to raise somebody up. If you don't take command, start feeding it to you. So when you feed it, you see it. That's the problem today with what's going on because what's being fed so much is doom, gloom, the abyss, and that's what you're going to see. It's still there. Opportunities are still there. Blessings are still there. Even more so. For 500 years, let's do it this way. For 30 years, Italy had pestilence, bloodshed, terror. They give us Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. For 500 years, Switzerland, Switzerland had peace and prosperity. They gave us the cuckoo clock. <laughs> you can come out of this stronger, and you can come out of it finding blessings. If you say to yourself, I'm not going to go through it, I'm going to grow through it. I'm not going to go for it, I'm going to grow forward. Mindset is everything, it controls your eyes. That's the problem with today. And it's also the solution. It's the solution. You're exactly right. So what is so so say that thing that you said in the airport one more time. I'm I'm not looking for I'm not looking for blessings to come into my life. I'm looking to be a blessing in somebody's life. Right. I want to raise somebody today. Amazing. And then I saw her because I was speaking that I saw her. When you speak it back to the language we started with, you start seeing it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Moving. Amazing. I, 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 and, and so healthy for us to feed ourselves with, with what you, what you say and what you think about. And I, that's why I always want to see you. And I, there's this one video of you um, where you literally pretty much give a speech right to the camera uh, that I love. That's about an hour long. And I have to watch that every year, at least once. Because you, you got to remind yourself yeah. because you get sucked into, like you said, the news and the social media. You get sucked into what your friends and your family are saying, which so much of it is negative. So much of it is fear. So much, so much of it is worry. So it's good to, you know, to, to also be the light in your community or your company or your family and, and remind people to turn that off and to think of things 
in the other way. Cause I mean, isn't it really just a choice with every single thing that happens to you? Isn't it just a choice how I'm going to look at it? It's just a choice. I, I, I you know, I, I hadn't heard it before, but I really heard it different when you just said it for the first time. I like how you said that. Re mind. You have to redo your mind. And <laughs> attitude is not a, a, a genus of muscle. So that was pretty cool. But I think that you have to go back and re choose. And I'm going to choose it again. And really, power comes from I'm going to make this choice. I don't feel like forgiving, but I'm going to choose to do it. I don't feel like leading, but I'm going to choose to do it. I don't feel like going forward, but I want to choose to do it. And you can't let your feelings govern you. Feelings are important, but don't let them govern you. And so it is a choice. You're exactly right. That's amazing. Well, Kevin, uh, all I can say to you is I wish we, I wish we could just sit here and, and break bread and talk for hours because it would be fun. We would talk about sports. We would talk about the mindset. We would talk about winning. We talk about greatness, being a champion, learning, growing, loving. You know, one of the other things I remember you saying is, uh, you know, whatever you give away comes back to you, you know, and it's, it's just so evident with, with a lot of the stories that you, that you tell and that we've heard today. So this was something I think I needed and, and I hope everybody watching felt like they needed and that their companies could need or their families need because um, it's just, it's righteous. It's, it's so healthy for the mind and for the soul too. So. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I, I absolutely was so excited that you said yes and that you were available and that we could do it as soon as we did. And you were one of the first ones I did and uh, all the pleasure was mine. So thank you so much, sir. Well, thank you. I believe in you and I believe in what you do and I believe you make a huge difference. So thanks for making me part of what you do as well. You're out there blessing people and starting people getting to remind them. So thanks for making me part of what you do. Thank you, Kevin. I will talk to you soon, my friend. Have a wonderful day. And again, peace, love, and I'll talk to you soon, brother. Thanks, Chris. Take care.